Okay, folks, uh, welcome to another Tuesday night lecture. I'm glad to say that we have uh, John with us this evening, uh, M0JAV. And uh, John, I'll let you do the introducing and everything else. And uh, after that, uh, the floor or screen, as we say now, I'm starting to make that a bit of a habit. I'm going to have to break that before things go back to normal. Uh, the screen is over to you, John. So uh, go ahead. OK, thank you very much. Um, first of all, I'm uh, going to check that you can see my screen OK. All OK? Yeah, yeah, can indeed. Good. Um, the next thing I'm going to do is to point out that everything I'm going to talk about tonight is in words on this famous website. People keep asking me, where do I find it? So you see this little box here called FAQs? It's on the top menu bar and drop down here. We have receiving interference. So if you click on that. It will take you to this page and it gives you frequently asked questions and answers, which is what I'm actually going to step through during the presentation tonight. So to make sure I didn't forget, I've done it at the beginning. So all you need to do is to go to the RSGB website, go to the FAQs, receiving interference. And then for each of the classes, uh, each of them, there's a drop down that gives you the long version of what I'm going to do in the video. So, all right, anybody still alive down there? You are allowed to interact, even Philip's allowed to ask the questions. Thank you, John. Yes, we're still <laughs> alive. Okay, so I'll see if I can start the presentation. I've tried once and failed, but hopefully second time will work. So that's me, um, often known as Mike Zero, just another volunteer. Um, I've been around uh, RSGB probably for a dozen or so years. Um, I started off as, and still am, uh, DR. I started off as DRM131, then I became DRM134, and I'm now DR133, I'm also chair of the EMC committee. And by not stepping back fast enough, I'm also currently on the board for the second time. So I'm going to talk tonight about radio frequency interference. So I guess the first thing that we need to do is to understand what radio frequency interference is. Now, to have radio frequency interference, you need a source of the interference, which I've shown is a nice simple brown box. And you need a victim for the interference, something that is going to suffer from interference. Then there are two ways of actually getting the interference from the source to the victim. One is if it's radiated, and the other is if it's conducted. Conducting doesn't mean you need a wire soldered between one and the other because interference is quite capable of being inductively coupled into a wire or capacitively coupled into a wire. And providing that wire is close to the source and close to the victim, then it will give you conducted interference. The other thing about radiated interference is that it can either be near field or far field. The difference being that the near field radiation falls off as the third power or the cube of distance and far field radiation power falls off as a square. All right, thumbs up if you've understood it all so far. Yep, yeah? good. You can explain it to me next week. That's what I always say. So how do you locate the sources that are nearby to you? Well, the simplest answer, if you can see my picture as well, is with 
a little radio. So I'm not sure whether you'll be able to hear this or not, but we can try. And as I move closer and further away from things in the shack, or as I make the antenna longer or shorter, so the interference gets picked up. So some people tell me sometimes I haven't got anything that will help me find the interference. Well, if you get close enough to it, then even a 10 pound supermarket traveler radio can be used to do it. Or you can go for a more expensive model like the uh, one shown here. So there's a little one I was using. There's a more expensive one. This allows you to do different types of modulation. Or if you've got an 817 or something similar, then with either a, a whip antenna or a simple wire loop antenna, you can actually track down. Now, what do I mean by track down? Basically, if you move yourself and the receiver around until you find the direction at which the signal level goes up, and then you keep going in a direction that the signal level goes up, then you will find the source. The problem is finding the right source. A lot of people set off, and because they don't have a clear picture of what it is they're trying to track down, either in sound or in spectrum, they end up finding lots of sources of interference, but not the one that was killing them in the first place. So the other thing that I always tell people to be careful of is what I call near field confusion. As you'll see in a little while, um, everything in my shack is radiating in the near field. And if I'm not careful, all I will do is find the interference from a screen or the light or some other switch mode power supply in the shack. So I must have a clear picture of what I'm looking for. A simple way of getting at that clear picture is to use a spectrum analyzer. Now, SDR Play, any of their models, um, there's a, on their site, there is a um, spectrum analyzer piece of software, which I shall demonstrate shortly. And you can connect that either to an E field or an H field antenna, a loop or a whip, and then you can use that to actually find a signature for what you're looking for. So now instead of just listening for an increase in noise, you actually watch the spectrum, you watch the spectrum rising in the bit that you're trying to track down, and you do exactly the same thing. You get closer to it, it gets louder, you get closer to it, it gets louder. So here's an example, and I will attempt a live demonstration in a moment, but here you can see um, the E field, the blue one is the E field without the source of interference turned on, because I found out what it is and turned it off. And the purple one is with it turned on. Now this isn't very clear at the moment because it's broadband spectrum, um, similarly at the bottom, the yellow one is without the interference on and the green one is with it on. Now what you can do is if you can find particular regions in frequency where the interference is the most problem, then instead of having these broadband spectra, you can come in with narrowband ones. It's very difficult to see, but there's a distinct series of extra lines in the purple E field as opposed to the bluey field, and that's the interference that you're looking for. So you have to be careful not to try and find near field sources. Um, even sometimes when you're looking for the source of interference, it will go off. Then you'll end up going to what is loudest what's causing the most interference just below the one you thought you were looking for. So it's always worthwhile checking 
that you've still got the signature that you're looking for. Still with me? It's not difficult, is it? So what I'm hoping is that you'll all realise at the end of this talk how easy it is, and you'll all sign up with your local regional representatives to become BMC volunteers. <laughs> so some people were talking about loops. Um, so let's have a look at a loop. Um, you can actually make the one that's on the screen there for less than a fiver. Because all you need is a 259 T piece, which is in here. A piece of cable, I'm using 213 because it's thick and stiff and keeps its shape. Or you can use thinner cable and use a BNC T piece, like the one I'm holding up to the camera at the moment. And then you take 900 millimeters, you solder a plug in the normal way on one end, you take about an inch of the screen off so that the center core is still going through, and then put a helis rink or something over it to waterproof it. At the other end, you connect the screen in the normal way to the PL259. You don't connect the center pin in the normal way. You short the center pin to the screen. And what you've got now then is as shown here, is a shielded loop. And that shielded loop will help you follow interference. So let me jump out of the slideshow. Is, is the 900 mil critical, John? No, no, it's, it, it's, um, it, if it's too much smaller, then it will only work locally. And if it becomes bigger than a tenth of a wavelength, then it will stop behaving like a small loop and start behaving like a big loop. Okay. And for, for what we want to do, we want it to behave like a small loop. And, 900 mil, or I think it was probably three foot when it was invented, um, is a fairly good way of doing it. So, is there, any, is there a PDF or instructions anywhere to make There that? is um, almost the same loop. There's a video from um, our Australian friends um, showing you how to make it. The only thing that they and I disagree with is they don't short the inner to the outer at the end. And I think they've got it wrong, but it will still work. It just won't have as high a gain as, as if you do that. Maybe it has to be that way upside down, to, you know, when you're on Australia. Yeah, probably. Um, I, I think they may have missed it out. You can even buy it for them for about, and it only costs you 31 euros to get it shipped over here, but you can make it for a few quid. So that's what I recommend. We're just going to start making them the night after it's full. <laughs> So let's, uh, I'm just clearing screens and stuff so that I can start up the spectrum analyzer. So there we go. If I blow that up the full screen, you should be able to see it. So this is an SDR play acting as a spectrum analyzer. And what I need to do is to select, because I've got several RSPs, I'll select the one that this is connected to. I've got it set to 20 meg bandwidth, um, centered on 10 meg. So if I sit, hit start, you will see what this loop is picking up in my shack. Okay, and as I turn it, so it's now nulled on that source of interference, which is about here, if you watch where the cursor is, if I turn it the other way, all right? Now, assuming that I was looking for that particular spike in where the cursor is, then what I would need to do is to approach and see it getting bigger, all right? Then I could check, because I've got a loop by rotating it, 
and saying, yep, yeah, that loops much finer in that direction. So let's go a bit closer in that direction. And then as I'm almost touching the screen, you can see that that is RFI from the screen. Now, is it a problem? To be honest, it isn't, because by the time I've got five foot away from it, which my antenna is, my real antenna, it's gone. So what I'm doing is showing you how to do it using a near field source, because they're much easier to come by in a shack than a real source outside. And if I look at um, the keypad on this thing, particularly if I look with E field, has another distinct pattern. My big monitor that I'm sharing with you, can you see that's got a completely different pattern of interference? So what I'd have to be careful is not to look for this one by mistaking it with that one. So that's what I meant by find the signature and then look for it. So if I look at the light that I'm using, that's got another pattern. If I look at the lead fluoro in the shack, that's got a lot more low frequency interference. Um, and, and it goes on and on. Any questions on that so far? And just one quick question, John, what are you using as a handle for? It's a piece of um, conduit, electrical conduit. Okay. And it's actually terry clipped to the T piece. Right. Yeah. So where the uh, T piece is fitted in the middle, and the plug is the uh, two five nines plugged into it. I've just split the tube to make it squeeze up a bit with a hacksaw and clamped it with a terry clip. What I don't want to be doing is holding this. No, no. Because I'll get a completely different set of results <laughs> if I actually become part of the antenna. No, dance, that's, that's quite a tidy wee antenna. And the other thing that is useful to use just here as he drops it on the floor. Probably never to be seeing working again. I'll send you the bill. The other thing that you can use, which I'll come on to when I go back to the slideshow, is a E field probe. You can buy those for a few quid, and the address is on the slideshow. And they will give you a completely different type of interference. Um, I'm not going to be brave and try and change things over at this stage because it failed on me completely last week when I did that. So, But the other thing that I can do if I stop this, which is the local one, then I can actually swap over my tuner and we can have a look at, uh, first of all, a Wellbrook loop outside. So now I'm not working off the loop I've got inside, but I've got an active Wellbrook loop outside. And I'm looking at what happens to be, it's about five meters from the shack, somewhere near a telephone line. And I see that sort of picture. And what I want to do here is to demonstrate to you how important it is, the parameters you look for. Now you can see a pattern and there's something funny going on here, round about four and a bit megs, and there's another hump here, round about 10 megs. But there's lots of real signals and lots of noise causing all these pictures. So if I set the spectrum analyzer to average mode, and I asked it to average over 50 cycles, then all of a sudden I see a different pattern. Because I'm now getting rid of all the, the noise, the random noise, because the average is taking it out. And what I'm left with is the residual sources of interference. Now, this one here, can you see that these steps, by the way, on the spectrum are 10 dB apart? So we've got about a 10 dB raise in the average noise. And can you see this very sharp rise here at 8.5 megahertz? 
and this very sharp drop here at 12 megahertz. Now those two frequencies, give or take 50 kilohertz, just happen to be the VDSL2 upstream 2 band interference. All right? So I can categorically say that I have interference from VDSL2 upstream 2. And down here, it's not quite so clear at the moment because there's a strong signal here, but between 3.8, which is here, you can see quite a lot of signal activity, which is masking it, but there is a five or six dB rise in there. There's a characteristic dip at 4.4, and there's a drop at 5.2, and that is the signature of VDSL2 upstream one interference. And that's showing up very clearly. So if I hold that, just so we remember it, and then hide it, show another trace, which is the same thing. But now I'm going to stop the trace, swap to the other port of my receiver, which has a knee field antenna on it, hold my cross my fingers and hit start, and hey, it's worked. So now looking at that with a dipole, you've got an absolutely completely different picture. Um, and again, if I do averaging, you'll see that whereas a little while ago you couldn't see anything, given time, you will see some patterns in the interference. But the E field and the H field are completely different. So it's important to look for both. So, any questions on that little demo? Could you do it? With a bit of practice, maybe. How close is your loop antenna to the telephone line, John? Well, it's uh, the loop is uh, there's a reckon. It, it's the answer is it's about three meters. But it's, it is three meters because that's the standard says recommendation 902 says you should measure the permissible interference from a telephone line at three meters away. That, that's the level. And then you can compare it with the standard. So that's why that's done. So you're, um, saying, you're saying a telephone line, I, I, I assume that's an overhead line, John? It is, but it could be the extension wiring as well because that radiates just as well. So with underground cables, you wouldn't get as much of a problem, would you? We thought at first you would get very little problem, but in fact we found it was only about 5 dB difference because the internal wiring of extensions um, makes up for it. Right. Certainly if you have no internal wiring, so you have an underground installation and you have um, the correct terminating plate, which is called an NTE 5C with Mark IV faceplate. That, that matches the line in the best way possible and isolates your, your voice circuits from your um, data circuits, then it is much better. Um, the other thing that you can do um, is if you don't want to use the spectrum analyzer, um, then you can use a traditional um, SDR Uno software, which will give you a spectrum and a waterfall, which is sometimes helpful. So hopefully if I hit play over there, Then you'll hear until I cut it off and see um, the spectrum that's coming up. And if you set it up in a similar way, then the one advantage that this has is you can compare the spectrum that's coming through. If you change something, you've got memory, if you like. You can actually see on the waterfall what's changed when you move your antenna around. So. Some people prefer to work one way, 
this these are real signals because this is up in the 40 meter band but, so that's just the other picture that you can have and in fact if you want to make recordings um, this particular piece of software comes with a, a simple recorder so you can just hit the record button it will save it to a file and then when you hit the stop button you can play it back and in fact you can play it back into some other analyzing software which we're developing which will help you um, identify things so I'll stop playing around with SDRs because they all look roughly the same I, I don't hopefully do get back to the screen show and it worked them recordings John they just play back in an orange so place. that's all you need to track down interference providing you don't have too many sources so what we usually say is for finding RFI and it's all of these next slides that are on that receiving interference page on the RSGB website so the first thing to do is to know what you're looking for I think it was Alice in Wonderland asked the cat um, which way should I go and the cat replied that depends on where you want to get to and Alice said I don't really mind where I want to get to so the cat said then it doesn't matter which way you go and why do I use that silly story I use it because you find a lot of people who end up looking for RFI without a clear picture of what it is they're looking for end up going the wrong way and finding something that isn't the problem so you need to know um, what frequencies it's on um, what the type of signal looks like is it harmonics is it spikes is it narrow or broadband interference once you know what you're looking for then the first thing to do is to turn your mains off work on batteries and go round because you can spend ages chasing interference that you think is coming from your neighbors and it's coming from your own house so throwing the big red switch having checked with everybody that it's safe to do so turned your computers off etc if the RFI goes away, it's in your house. If you switch it back on again one circuit at a time, you'll probably be able to find it. You, you may not need to go any further than that. But you need a battery operated receiver. You need to know what you're looking for. And then, as I demonstrated before, you need to turn off any possible sources of interference other than the mains. Um, if you've got solar PV panels on your roof, then turning off the mains is not going to stop them making a noise. The same with laptops on battery power, cars, mobile devices, burglar alarms. They can all still cause you interference. So you might want to turn off a few more things. If you've checked everything and you know it's not from your house, then you need to find it. Um, you, as I've said, at least 14 times you need to know what you're looking for you might want to check with a different antenna because as i showed you a little while ago e and h fields can give you quite different pictures as can different antennas and it's worthwhile checking before you go too far hunting in your neighbor's area that if you go a few hundred meters away that it's not still there because if it is then it's more likely to be a real signal or interference that's too far away for you to be likely to find if over a period of time you can log when the interference is there and when it's not and how strong it is and which direction it's coming from that will help you trace it then there is a very helpful leaflet called EMC04 um, and using an SDR you can find out um, how to locate the interference. Assuming that you've got a very cooperative neighbour and you found that it's his 
battery charger for his mobility scooter or whatever it is that's causing the interference then there is one test that I can guarantee will confirm that and it's called the Anophon test do you know what the Anophon test is? okay it's the Anophon and you confirm you found it right you turn it on and you see it you turn it off and it's gone and you turn it back on again and it comes back again that's the categoric way of finding the source of interference confirming it absolutely positively but you've got to be a bit careful of sources with standby because when you turn them back on again they may come back into a standby mode and all of a sudden you've got a new source of interference which is the switch mode power supply giving off different art, different interferences in standby mode to what it does in main mode so i demonstrated some of this to you um, earlier and you can see you know having trace saved a trace of what it was like with it off and with it on um, either with e or h this was the touch screen on the laptop that i couldn't easily demonstrate live but you can see that there's a whole series of regularly spaced spikes on there and that is digital noise from the touch screen on my laptop here touch pad on my laptop so how do you identify the signatures there's one other little check that it's worth doing and that is to turn the preamp on your receiver off and to put an attenuator in because a lot of receivers will actually overload and generate what looks like interference um, and they're artifacts of your receiver and not real interference so it's worth either using attenuators turning preamps off or using a second receiver to confirm that it's still there then if you record or snapshot the spectrum the waterfall then you know what you're looking for and you can go find it so a quick, quick trace through some different types of interference you probably recognize this one because i showed it to you earlier this is vdsl on h field vdsl on e field and here it's a different time of day when there's less real signals around you can actually see the bands on the e field as well as the h field in the day in the evening you can't because the noise has come up this is a power supply i thought what i really need when i'm going out doing my hunting um, is I need a power supply that I can take with me. It'll either work in the person's house or it'll work on 12 volts. I went to the Matlin site. I thought, absolutely fantastic. I've got just what I want till I turn the bloody thing on. <laughs> this is the power supply. It's generating harmonics all the way up the band. And you can see the characteristic pattern here. So now it's useful when i'm driving between one place and another but i dare not use it i have to run on the internal battery to help you find what different real signals and signatures look like there's an excellent site and i'll demonstrate this at the end it's called sig id wiki and it gives you a sound picture a recording and the spectrum of what different real signals and some interfering signals look like. So that's very good. Um, when we did our kitchen up at home, my wife who has some sight problems, we decided to go from gas to an induction hob. Um, this is the induction hob all of these lines being turned on coming up to the boil changing from simmer to heating mode 
Um, and that's five meters away outside with a Wellbrook loop. Very distinct pattern, easy to do. The particular picture I'm showing you here is on the field strength logger, which allows me to actually record the levels accurately enough to uh, be uh, interrogated on them. So, um, so that's what an induction hob looks like. This is three different measurements of a fairly quiet switch mode power supply. Um, the yellow one is taken on an H field loop. Um, the green one is a current clamp. Now, what do I mean by a current clamp? Can you still see my picture okay? It's a split ferrite with five terms of wire around it going to a B and C plug. You put that over a cable and then feed it into your SDR and you can find conducted emissions. And the bottom blue one is the E field. So I'm trying to show you how looking with different um, pieces of equipment at a source can give you different pictures and several sources of interference, one on top of each other. Um, I've got a little massager, um, an electronic one. <laughs> one of these, uh, it's made in Australia actually, but it's, it basically um, eases the muscles a bit. But when you turn it on, the background noise goes from round about here, jumps up 20 dBs, and that's not being really close to it on the E field, and the H field is different. But of course, the H field is the superposition of all the problems I have with VDSL and the massager. And what we've also done is we've used the field strength logger. This one is showing you um, on a spectrum running from zero to 20 megahertz. It's showing you all the band transitions on VDSL. So there's the downstream and upstream bands all the way up to the top and this meter is taking a reading it's also recording exactly where it was the time and the reading is corrected for the antenna factor um, and converted to db marker volts per meter which is what the standards are written in so it allows us to go and take measurements and say you know at normal background noise you would expect to be between zero and 10 db microvolts per meter so vdsl is raising the noise floor only by 40 db and we got quite ambitious with this we put the wellbrook loop on top of the car and we drove around with the field strength log and logging the signal strength so we could produce heat maps um, yellow is unacceptable, blue is nice, red is bloody awful. I won't let you guess where I live, but um, you wouldn't be far off if you said it was here somewhere. So for distance sources, you can also triangulate, triangulate with the loop and, and help to find them if they're not VDSL. So in summary, use something portable if you haven't got an SDR. Look for increase in signal, check whether it's going up by um, doubling uh, 3 dB or 6 dB every time you halve the distance or if it's going up by the cube of the distance. And it's very easy to see once you've tried it. Look out for near field sources because you'll think you found it and you haven't. For distant sources, you can either use the loop to df or you can triangulate look at the intercept or you can use a mobile setup and just go towards the signal as it gets louder um, and i talked about sig id wiki helping you find real signals because you don't want to track them down and claim their interference there's some graphs of background levels so quiet rural is this green line um, rural is the blue line, 
residential's the red line. So you can see that anything much above 10 dB microvolts per meter is not normal. The funny curly lines are the difference in atmospheric noise day and night. During the daytime, the atmospheric noise is much lower. At night time, it gets quite a bit higher. And just to complete the picture, the purple line is galactic noise, space noise. So <clears throat> you now have to do the exam. While I have a sup of coffee, how many, you don't have to tell me what they are, but how many different sources of interference can you see there? <clears throat> Let me help you a bit. So you recognize this one, I assume. I've been through it several times. That's VDSL upstream one, running between 3.75 and 5.2 megs. Ditto, you can just see here, the one running between 8.5 and 12 megs, upstream two. Do you think this is a normal signal? What about these funny bits? No. Nope. What about this stuff up here? Yep. Looks so, a bit fishy to me. I used to have a USB um, four to one type thing that ran off a power supply until I found out what this was caused by. So that went in the bin. This peculiar pattern coming up here is one of two things because I can't remember which one this is. Um, oh, it says it's a central heating boiler. So central heating boilers these days have modulated pumps to, to change the speed and, and they have a pretty distinct pattern as do some fridges with digital inverters in. They have a fairly distinct pattern and they both look a bit like that. So if I was really doing this diagnosis, then what I'd need to do is to go down, look in much finer detail because this device allows me to expand that. I can measure the difference in frequency of the spikes and then I've got a signature to look for. And, you know, SMPSUs have a specification and if they stick to that specification, yes, you'll still see them on your spectrum, but they generally won't cause you any problems. The same with LED lamps. Here are two. This is the specification they're supposed to meet. This one clearly meets it and causes no problems. This one clearly doesn't and causes heaps of RFI. And there's plenty of advice, as I said at the beginning, on the website. Don't forget SIG ID Wiki. And thank you for being a wonderful audience. Thank you, John. Do you uh, have any questions? Indeed. There's always questions, Are you still John. There? There's always questions. <laughs> I didn't see anybody fall asleep. John, um, can't hear anybody. You talked about the uh, VDSL. Yeah. What's it? Is it going to be dealt with? I know we we sort of we touched on this when we were chatting the other the other week, but where's the whole process? Our Ofcom listening. What do we need to do? Or uh, you know, will anything be done about VDSL interference? We can only try is the simple answer to that. As I said, um, you know, I have been working with a number of other people on VDSL interference since 2012. And in fact, David Lord has been working on it since 2006. Um, we've, each time we've had hope, we got some really good tests, which we did with um, BT and OpenReach at Martlesham, their test site. We worked out uh, how to help and how to minimize it and found that the line balance was a big factor so 
we got a scheme whereby we can ask for a line balance in the early days when the lots of the lines were very badly balanced. Then we got some big improvements and we thought it was great. But as more and more installations went in, and bear in mind that because VDSL is broadband noise from zero up to 17 meg, and it's absolutely pseudo-random, very difficult to find out what it is, then if you get two lines near to you of equal strength, then you've got twice the interference. So as more and more people came on, even if the individual lines weren't going to cause the interference, the, some of them did. So then we got agreement from Ofcom to do testing with us. And right throughout 20, the back part of 2018 and 2019, um, well, in between, we decided to undertake a survey. We had 1,200 responses. 55% um, of the people who responded had interference. We did all the drive-by testing. I show you with the loop on the top of my car. And we convinced Ofcom that they would do some testing with us. They did the testing. The results are published on the website. And they basically said that there was definitely an electromagnetic disturbance there, but it, it was nothing that they needed to do anything about because we could always change frequency or use a different mode or talk to somebody else, which is not good. So what we decided to do um, as the RSGB was to try and get a lot of people to make some measurements and to try and show them the extent of the problem. What we then intend to do is to tackle them about the fact that they are not enforcing in the way we think they should. And we will also go back to OpenReach, who we've done testing with before, and ask them if they will fix it. The fix is known. The system is designed with notches built in for the amateur bands. All we need them to do is to turn those notches on. But it will cost them bandwidth if they do. We think they now have sufficient spare bandwidth to turn them on and still be able to offer a good service. But the argument that Ofcom use is that there are 29 million people using VDSL broadband and you've only had 35 amateurs complain. Fortunately, we now had another 70 complain and would like to thank everybody who's done it. If you haven't done it, please go to the May issue of Redcom, find out how to and, and help. You don't have to go and buy a, an SDR. I'm sure somebody's got one. And, you know, with one of these loop antennas, you can go and take measurements in your friend's front garden. You don't have to break lockdown rules. and. Uh, you can send the complaints in. What we really need is a large number. Um, they're not going to look at them in phenomenal detail. So as long as you're convinced you've got it, send it in. And then we've got the numbers. So are they going to do it? I hope so. Um, but I can't guarantee it. And I've already spent six years trying to persuade them. Are, are all these BDSL problems because of copper from the cabinet to the premises? If yeah. you direct to the house, does that make a difference? Uh, <laughs> you obviously haven't. Um, I actually had FTTP installed a week and a half ago. Um, um. And um, the, the FTTP is fantastic, but my VDSL noise has gone up by 10 dB. I'm pretty certain I know why. I was um, the press on the fiber to the premises. Well, FTTP uses a um, piece of cable that looks like this. It's got the fiber, which is in the middle, but it's also got a copper pair. <clears throat> and the copper pair provides the telephone circuit. And until they disconnect the copper pair in the VDSL cabinet, it's still bringing all the interference into my property. So I'm waiting. When they do the installation, they install the fiber, 
and then at some st- time in the future, according to the pole monkey who came and did my phone for me, then they disconnect what they call a cease service and they disconnect the copper from the VDSL cabinet. But until they do, it comes down. And for the short time before they took the modems off, that new piece of copper in the 10 meters across my street increased my VDSL speed. This is before FTTP was connected, but after the cable was put in, from 20 megabits per second to 70 megabits per second. So it must have been a pretty awful copper cable in the first place. And the new one's a good bit of copper cable, but it's still carrying interference. So. But FTPP will solve the problem. But you might have to get your neighbours to do it as well as yourself. Any other questions? John, I, I was wondering uh, uh, about your the, the spectrum analyzer that you showed. It was showing from zero to 24 or something like that, a very wide spectrum. How, how were you able to do that? I mean, even, even with a, an SDR receiver that only has, say, two mega, megahertz of bandwidth, are you able to tell it to sort of sample the whole spectrum? The, the RSP steps up through the spectrum sequentially. The, right. the guy who wrote the software, um, it, it, you can set what steps it does and that sort of thing, but it, and it depends on how many points you want to do in the FFT, but it, it actually does a step and sweep effectively. So. Right, very useful. And, and I was also wondering how you actually mitigate against the v, VDSL yourself you know what techniques do you, do, you, do you use to sort of get around it because it's obviously affecting you i um my antennas are i don't know 50 meters away at the top of the garden and a bit further away from the pole i still have some telephone lines which run across my property which is what causes the main problem but i use a wellbrook loop and if you put the Wellbrook loop under the telephone lines, it sounds silly, and then null the loop on the telephone line, it gives you about the best cancellation. So but the main thing that works in my favour is the bands that are really bad for me are the upstream bands. And apart from 3.75 megahertz, I don't use them. 3.75 is the uh, emergency frequency. I'd like to have that back. But I don't. I just don't use them. I've not done 10 megs because I couldn't, uh, I couldn't get through. It's so noisy. Do you, do you use the loop to receive and then <coughs> other antenna for transmit? Transmit. Correct. Yeah, yep. I use a separate receive loop. And what do you do when you're transmitting? Would, would that not potentially damage your receiver that's no no because um the thing it would do is damage the loop if i had them too close together but i keep them 20 meters apart okay and a lot of people do that um you know john gould um he's got two loops for different bands in different parts of his garden and and uh that, and he's got them on rotators, so he can twist them to null out whatever he wants. Um, I've also done some experiments with a um, MFJ analog noise cancellor. Um, and that's why I built what we call Snappy Dog. So I don't know if you can see that. There's two bits of wood with a ferrite in the middle, sprung loaded, so I can put it on a pole, I can pull on the cord and it will open the dog's mouth. There's a current transformer wound on there. So I put it on a painter's decorator pole, I hold it up near the telephone line, I open the mouth, clip it on the line and shut it. I can then take the signal from there and use it to phase cancel with what's coming in on my antenna. 
and I got a 10 dB reduction in noise by doing that, but only for one line, unfortunately. <laughs> and also, I probably couldn't leave it up, although I do know some people who've climbed a pole and um, mounted a more discreet version permanently on the telephone line. And obviously making sure it's a telephone wire, not an electric wire, before you start mounting <laughs> things but on absolutely. it. Absolutely. <laughs> we, we don't recommend any of that. But um, it, you're right. You have to do that. Um, and if you look on the website, you'll find the, the full talk. Um, in particular, um, there's a bit of software on the RSGB website. Um, which I'm going to try and put up, but I've got to remember to share the screen um, before I lose the screen. So there's a bit of software on the RSGB website called Leylantos, um, which hopefully you can see in a second. Is it up now? Yes. Okay, now what the, this software was written by Martin Sack, and what it does is you, you make a recording on an SDR it, um, of about half a second to a second. The instructions are all there. Then you play it back through the software, and the software, first of all, produces a spectrum, which he then puts a digital filter on to take off the real signals, and you end up with this spectrum. Then he analyzes the signals in that part of the spectrum um, with some very clever software that looks for the characteristics of VDSL and proves that there is, that's one cycle of one VDSL, that's a second one, the two peaks there and there, and then there's a third one with two peaks there and there. And he correlates it very accurately in time when these two line up, then he's calibrated the SDR clock to the VDSL clock, because if that's out, when you're dealing with pseudo random signals, even being a few parts per million out on the clock, will give you the wrong answer. So this software will categorically prove that it's VDSL in a number of, and it's free, it's on the website. And the guy who wrote it, Martin, is now the um, EMC coordinator for the IARU worldwide. Um, and he's also the guy who wrote a lot of the software in the chips in the VDSL system. Which is how we were able to get him to help us. So. Okay. Any other questions? John, uh, it's George, uh, GI4SJQ here. Um, Hi, George. Um, thank you very much uh, for, for your talk this evening because it's been, uh, uh, with it being focused specifically on VDSL, it's been, uh, well, I have a small VDSL issue. Uh, it's, it's not my primary issue at the moment, but uh, I've run those tests that you described and, and they're very simple to run. And it was able to confirm that I had uh, VDSL issues at 3.75 megahertz. I uh, wasn't able to find anything in the 8 to 12 meg band uh, to the same extent, but I uh, could definitely see it at uh, 3.75, which was borne out by the VHF rig. Uh, and you could see the noise level increase on the pan adapter as you uh, tuned up through that part of the band. Um, you, you really answered one of my questions pretty early on with the, the link to the... Uh, the, the website to look at different types of interference. Um, I've been suffering with interference which I've tracked down to the next door neighbor. Uh, I don't know what it is yet, but I've been trying to uh, figure out if, uh, if I can identify the, the, the device or equipment that's generating it uh, before I go near, the, near them, uh, as they are uh, foreign nationals and their use of English is uh, maybe limited. Um, some guy turning up with a, a radio and antenna uh, asking them about interference might be the, the best policy. Um, but uh, what I'm seeing is broadband noise that rises and falls by maybe 6 to 10 dB 
uh, right across the HF spectrum, right up to six meters. Plus there's uh, peaks roughly every 80 kilohertz. So I'm hoping that website's gonna have uh, some images that might help me uh, identify the source. It, it, may, it may do, unfortunately there's not enough there yet. But um, yeah. we, the, it, in the end, um, unless it has a very clear signature, you're going to have to do the getting closer and getting louder test. Yeah. But if, you, yeah, well, if, if it is a neighbor, um, and you you know, in the end, they are willing to cooperate, then the enough on test will find it for you. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, I built a, a full size transmitting uh, magnetic loop initially, uh, about a meter 20 in diameter and walked around the estate with that, which got it pretty close. And then I went out with an ARDF receiver on 80 meters one morning and uh, pretty well identified the location within the house because uh, I was able to walk right past the sidewall. So it's uh, just finding the opportunity now to actually talk to him. Well, Ken, Ken Underwood, who um, runs our help desk, he has what he calls the champagne and chocolates approach, <laughs> which is when you've found out which neighbour it is, when you knock on the door, make sure you've got a bottle of champagne and a box of chocolates to give them. <laughs> Um, so that they don't get defensive and offensive, if you understand yes. what I mean. Good idea. So I put up on the screen um, another picture. All of these are in the talk, which is on the RSGB website now that I gave a week and a half ago. This is the faceplate I was talking about, the NTE 5C. Um, it goes on as your master socket. You don't want these horrible things on the right. They're the ADSL filters. They don't work very well. Distributed microfilters, what you want is a dedicated box, and that helps a lot too. It isolates, it gives better termination to your VDSL signal, and it also isolates the interference getting onto your extension wiring in your house. Is that, you a, user, is that a user fitted one, or do, do BT have to fit that? BT will say because it's the master socket that they have to fit it. But if you go to page 56 of the tw February 2020 Radcom, David Lauder has taken a, a separate one of these and fitted on the back of here an ordinary running socket, which you plug into your existing master socket. Then you're per providing you're plugging it into their master socket and not modifying their master socket, there's no problem. So what he's done is he's disconnected all the extension wiring from the master socket, connected it into this one, put it on a small flying lead, plugged it into the master socket, and he now has a double master socket, the new one working much better than the old one, the new one belonging to him and the old one belonging to OpenReach. So page 56 of the February 2020 20 Radcom shows you how to do it. I was just trying to find it here, but I can't find it. You can look it up. And the uh, May Radcom, which gives you all the instructions, we've now put as the, the whole magazine is shared on the RSGB website. So even if you don't get Radcom, yep. you can pick it up. All right, are you fed up with me by now? Any other final questions there for John before uh, uh, before we end? Anyone, any burning RFA questions? Did you make a recording, by the way, Dave? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Could you, is it possible you could send it to me just so that uh, if I wanted to do this... Um, with another club, I could uh, share it with them. Is that possible? Yeah, absolutely. It, it'll be on our uh, YouTube channel. Uh, and I can yeah. download it from there if I wanted to, can I? Well, you can either get the, the actual full clip sent to you, John, via email or uh, however you want to watch it on YouTube. It's up to yourself. Uh, but it will be there um, pro hopefully by the end of play tomorrow. So Good. Thank you very much.
Sorry, Philip, you were just about to say something there before I yeah, cut you off. Stop the recording, so can I ask John a real question? <laughs> okay, any other questions there then uh, before we uh, sort of stop? Nope, okay. Uh, John, thanks very much for coming along there as uh, it was very helpful and useful indeed. And as I say, you'll be able to find this and our other lectures on our YouTube channel. If you go to youtube.com and search for M-E-A-R-C, uh, our club YouTube channel will come up uh, with the club icon there. And there's all our other lectures that have appeared on Tuesday evening. So, John, thanks very much. And uh, you can hang fire sure, uh, around for another few minutes. So thank you indeed. Thank <laughs> you.